Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, as uh, they mentioned, my name is Brad Steinmetz, and I teach uh, primarily design and technology in the Department of Theater, Film, and Media Arts. Uh, I cannot wait to introduce you uh, to uh, Paul Bay, a uh, writer and podcaster, and to all of the students, faculty, and staff who've been involved in this production based on his podcast, uh, The Big Loop. Uh, but before I do, I want to I want to say thank you to everybody else who I don't already know. Uh, thank you so much, and and uh, I'd like to give you just a little bit of background on why we're here. Uh, this event is about Paul Bay, and about the intersections between uh, theater and podcasting. As you might imagine, it's a very peculiar time to to produce theater, and uh, the Department of Theater, Film, and Media Arts got together less than a year ago now, and completely reimagined what our production season would be for the 2021 uh, year. And we've done a lot of things this year we've never done before, including filming, uh, outside filming, sometimes filming uh, stage productions. We've uh, created a, a play on Zoom and uh, we decided that we would try creating or rather producing an audio drama, a, a, a fiction podcast. And with Paul Bay's help, we were able to use uh, his uh, text from uh, The Big Loop as the basis for our students sort of reinterpretations of it. And that's why we're all here. So uh, uh, let me start by introducing uh, Paul Bay. Uh, Paul is a writer and podcaster based in British Columbia. He's the award-winning creator of the Big Loop podcast, as well as the co-creator and writer for a podcast called The Black Tapes, which has been downloaded more than 43 million times. He also directs the Marvel Studios podcast, Marvels, based on the classic comics. You've probably heard of them. Uh, Paul's also a former teacher and uh, has written about his experience uh, teaching as well. And, uh, and, and also, I, I, I think I can say this now, Paul, I think you're also uh, developing two new audio series uh, for Spotify. Isn't that right? Uh, one. They picked up one. I'm not allowed to say which one yet, though. <laughs> OK. All right. Well, we won't spill the beans. Paul, thank you so much for being here and a good evening from us and good afternoon to you. Uh, uh, thanks for having me on, Brad, and everyone at Ohio State. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna give the uh, uh, students a chance to introduce themselves as well. And I'll start with uh, Shakaya Lee. Hello, my name is Shakaya Lee, uh, pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am the voice of Kate in episode two, you. Um, I am a third year theater and linguistics double major. Thank you so much. Hi, I'd love to introduce you now to Varsha Babu. Hi, my name is Varsha Babu. I'm a first year theater major and I am on the first episode of The Big Loop in the episode, uh, story. Yep, the surrogate. And on the third episode in uh, Wide Awake. Thanks so much. Hi, I'd love to introduce you to Kelsey Painter. Hi, I'm Kelsey Painter. I'm Tammy in The Circuit with Varsha, and I'm the host of episode three, and I am a fourth year theater major. Thanks, Kelsey. I'd like to introduce you to Devin Reeves. Hi, I'm Devin Reeves. I am playing Grace in episode three, The Eye of the Lord. And I am a second year sociology major with a theater minor. Hi, I'd love to introduce you to uh, Mohan Fitzgerald. Hi, uh, I'm Mohan. I am a third year creative writing graduate student. I uh, assist and directed, I think, the uh, the whole production and I made the theme music that is in chapter or uh, episode one. Uh, yeah, I'm a I'm from Toronto. I make audio essays and I'm a writer. I think it says something about the project that you still aren't quite sure what it is that you did for the, for the show. <laughs> I'd love to introduce now uh, Dominic Fleshman. Hi, I'm Dominic Fleshman. I'm a fourth year business major specializing in marketing. I'm also a theater minor. I play the priest in Wide Awake and some bullies and the dad in Mr. Adams. Thanks. I'd love to introduce you to uh, Ting Xuan Du. Hi, I'm Ting Xuan Du and I'm a second year theater major and a business minor. Uh, I played uh, the bullies in The Good by Adams and 
the Anato in you in episode two, and I'm from China, Beijing. Thanks so much. I want to introduce you to、uh, Jacinda Forbes. Hi, I am Jacinda Forbes. I am a third year theater and strategic communications major. I played Tammy and the mom in Goodbye, Mr. Adams, and I played Cora in You. And、uh, I want to introduce you to Griffin Mason. Hi, I'm Griffin Mason. I'm a fourth year theater major. I I played Mr. Adams in Goodbye, Mr. Adams.、Uh, Michael slash the narrator in You. I am also the sound designer and editor for both Miss Goodbye, Mr. Adams and The Surrogate. So. Thank you all so much. So we had、uh, about thirteen different students working with us on the project. Not everybody was able to be here,、uh, but now I want to introduce、uh, our faculty member Mandy Fox, who、uh, directs the、uh, actors and the episodes. Hi, Mandy. Hi there. I'm Mandy Fox, and I am an acting and directing faculty member. I'm the voice specialist in the Department of Theater, Film, and Media Arts,、um, specializing in dialects and tone of the voice. And I'm working on building a narration and voice acting minor. So stay tuned. And I want to introduce you to、uh, Kia Miles Alkire, who's been our audio engineer, designer, instructor, and just about everything else. Hi, I'm Kia Myers Alkire, and、uh, yeah, I do all the sound stuff and some media stuff around the department. Holy mo! I can't believe we still have time. There's a, there was a lot of people involved in this production, and I really appreciate、uh, everybody、uh, coming in.、Uh, we already have a question,、um, and and I will answer it really quickly because、uh, this podcast、uh, that. These students have put together was based on Paul Bay's The Big Loop podcast, which I'm now sharing the link with you. So everybody should、uh, check out the original podcast、uh, by Paul Bay. And、uh, here, if you if you are, are if you're hungry for more, then is、uh, the project that our students put together.、Uh, the very first episode of which has dropped. I guess you can say that has dropped just today.、Uh, Thank you so much, y'all.、Uh, uh, Paul, could I? Now that we're really into it, I, I will only ask you one question because I really want the students、uh, to to be the question askers. But I'll start by saying, you know, we didn't know like almost anything when, when we started this. We're all from the field of theater primarily, and some other weird places,、uh, and so we had to learn、uh, almost from scratch, even though the performers have performed before. And the audio designers and engineers have done that before as well, but for different media.、Um, so, I、I'm, can you tell us a little bit about、uh, how much or little you knew about podcasting when you started? Yeah, you know what? Every project I take on, I, I'm very familiar with that feeling that all of you felt like, "What am I doing? Like, what, what, where do you start? And how does it go from this mic into this phone?" Like,、um, even after the success of the Black Tapes, after two years, when I launched the Big Loop as a solo project. Uh, because my black tapes partner Terry Miles,、uh, who's brilliant, he kept urging me. You know, you got all these stories, put out a solo one. And then when I finally did it, and I wrote it, and I cast the actors, I had to call Terry. I'm like, hey,、uh, can you explain to me how I get it from my recording to the phone? Because I didn't even know after two years of podcasting how he did that. Because he was in charge of it all. So don't worry about not knowing anything.、Um, when I started the black tapes,、uh, we did it.、Uh, Terry and I did it in、um, uh, in an attempt. To get attention to our screenplay, which no one was paying attention to,、uh, you know how does you write something? You put it out in the world, or in this case, to Terry's agent、uh, at the time, who he's no longer with,、um, and, and then it just didn't go anywhere. I guess no one was really interested in another horror or reading another horror, and so、uh, we came up with an idea of making an audio fiction, and thank, we sort of copied the format created by Serial, where a, a journalist in a nonfiction setting. Sort of inserts herself accidentally into the story, and she becomes a major character. And so we thought, oh, that's re- that's really interesting. The blurred lines between journalism, journalist, and subject, that's perfect for our story. Our our our. So I had zero experience, and I'd never written for audio. I'd written for you know plays that went nowhere, short stories,、uh, novels that never finished, poems that only certain、uh, ex girlfriends will know about,、uh, hopefully. Um, but I've never, I never knew, I, I'd never written for audio, 
And so I just ended up consuming a ton of audio, uh, like uh, This American Life, uh, 99% Invisible, uh, um, uh, uh, what, is, what is that one, the uh, lab, uh, Radio Lab? I think it's Radio Lab. Um, anyways, a whole bunch of those, you know, the standard ones uh, that everyone sort of used as a gateway into podcasting. And I was one of those people that first experienced podcasting through that. And then Night Vale, uh, of course, um, and that was it. And then we just dove into the, writing the black tapes knowing um, sound would be carrying our story. Uh, we did have an advantage though, in that we were working in a genre of horror, where, you know, to be honest, you know, horror tends to really work well when you don't see the scary parts. You just know about it. And so that helped us a lot. And again, copying that serial format slash This American Life, it, just, it was just easy to plug stuff into it. Was well, interesting to hear that you you've uh, written for, for so many different sort of disciplines for uh, for plays and 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 films and, and novels and stuff like that. You, you know what I should do is, uh, can I pass the mic to uh, to Devin Reeves, who may have a question or two on, on that subject? Hi. Yeah. Um, so I follow your Twitter, and I've noticed that you're on um, working on a lot of projects and um, sort of working to get into some TV and um, maybe movie scripts. So I just wanted to ask. Um, now that you've worked pretty extensively in audio and are sort of moving to those visual mediums, um, what are your favorite parts of each? And then do you miss anything when you switch between them? Uh, my favorite part in, the, uh, in both mediums is the writing. That's just my favorite part. I like telling stories. Uh, so uh, it's, it's easy, it was easy for me to switch to different mediums uh, or media, because uh, I used to be a stand-up comic. I used to be a TV host where, and a producer in that daily format. It was like a, a local version of the daily show. But as long as I was writing and telling stories, I was happy. Um, so my favorite part in podcasting TV, the writing. The second favorite part for podcasting is casting. Um, because once I found the cast, um, especially for the big loop, uh, for example, um, once I found someone, I would rewrite the script and I would rewrite the script to their voice. So for example, in something like Goodbye Mr. Adams, I'd written the script and then I called a buddy who did the bright sessions and I said, hey, Brigham Snow, who's, a, who's a, an excellent actor. And I'd say, Brigham, do you, do, you, do you want to play this character? And I sort of broke down what it was. And he said, yeah, let's do this. And so I had to rewrite it knowing Brigham was going to do it. Uh, the same thing happened with, um, uh, well, basically every episode of The Big Loop. Um, I would rewrite it for, for the actors. And so that was, that was the fun part. With TV, I haven't gone past the pilot stage yet. So I've, I've had, I've sold, I think, four uh, episodes of four pilots uh, to develop for TV. To, I'm right now working on two for networks I can't mention, but um, I'm looking forward to the point where I get to cast those actors. And then uh, if, and if I ever get a green light and then of course, matching the dialogue to the actor. Um, I'm not sure if TV is amenable to that because I, I haven't got there yet. Where audio drama, everything's on the fly so quick um, as I hear it, it is for TV, but there's no one for me to answer to in independent audio drama. Like I don't need to ask a studio, hey, can I change these lines? I just change the lines in the room and then they would perform it and we do three different versions and it's okay. And that, you know, it's, it sometimes led to mistakes. Uh, for example, in, in season three of the Black Tapes, we were so rushed uh, because of a unforeseen hurdle, um, which I can't go into, but I'd written so quickly with the research, uh, I, I accidentally called uh, one of your presidents, Andrew Garfield, uh, the Spider-Man actor. Um, and and we were we were we were, we wrote we recorded so many episodes per day that uh, or so many scenes per day no one caught it. Plus us being Canadian, they thought oh I'm sure the actors thought oh I'm, that's weird that a president's named Andrew Garfield. Um, hope he was charismatic. And so <laughs> if you if you listen to the Black Tape season three, you'll hear about two references to the famous actor who was not president. You know, I didn't notice. Um, <laughs> I took it at face value. I was like, yeah, our president, Andrew Garfield. So. Oh, you just, you, you fake it till you make it. I guess that's the thing. <laughs> well, thank you. I thought it was fascinating the way you described working on an independent podcast in that uh, you've got no one, nobody to answer to. And uh, I think that's something that's very similar in the world of theater. I think as actors, as designers, uh, even as directors, we spend a lot of our time like, hoping like somebody big's gonna, you know, call our name so that we sort of get permission uh, to start doing our stuff. 
Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, part of what we do here and, and part of what I, I see you do and so many people do is to not wait for permission, but to, to produce your own work uh, is, I guess my question is, uh, it, maybe my question is, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how freeing that may have been for you? Well, uh, it was it was incredibly freeing. I, I might, uh, it was very liberating, I, sh is, is, I should say, because I have a lot of friends in theater um, and, and they would tell me about how, you know, you queue things up for the stage, uh, you have to sort of lobby and pitch. It's, it's like, it's like, it reminds me of the, the way they describe it, it reminds me of the TV process where you have to like, you have to pitch your heart out and find different homes for your, for your idea. Whereas for podcasting, I like the big loop, when it, when it cemented and crystallized what I was going to do, I just cast actors uh, by looking at them online, listening to all their work. Then I'd contact them. My name is Paul Bay. Do you want to work with me? Sure. Meet me at the library because there's a podcasting studio, uh, which the Vancouver Public Library has for free for the public, uh, these soundproof booths. They'd meet me there. I'd tell them what they're getting paid and we'd work that out. We'd sit down. I'd record. I wouldn't have to ask anybody for permission. Um, I just recorded. And then we did it in one or two takes and then we're done. And then I went back and then my my partner for the uh, the Big Loop, my uh, audio engineer, Steve Jin, he would take all the files that I recorded and then just turn it into, you know, use his magic. Um, the same thing happened with Marvels with Misha Stanton, who's brilliant. Uh, they would just, I don't, I don't even know how they were able to do what they do, given all the different takes we had. It was incredibly pomp complex when you have something corporate like that. And we have, we, there's a whole bunch of steps you have to go through. Um, but with Big Loop, we're something independent. Uh, it is a little bit scary though, having no one to answer to. Uh, Cause I know that if, if I screwed up, like I did with the Andrew Garfield situation, uh, I, everyone's gonna make fun of me. Well, I tell you, uh, I'm gonna write a letter to our president, Andrew Garfield and see if we can get okay. libraries with podcasting stations in them. And that's, that's something that our country needs. Um, <laughs> Uh, I would love to uh, reintroduce uh, Mohan Fitzgerald, who is also a writer. And as, as you may remember, he's a grad student focusing on creative writing. And uh, I think he may have a couple questions as well. Yeah, I mean, actually hearing you talk, I mean, I think I knew about your past doing comedy, but it just occurred to me um, that the transition from stand-up comedy to writing primarily horror is like, it. In some ways, I feel like that's a really strange jump to make, but I can also kind of see some similarities between those two forms. I guess I'm wondering, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just uh, interested to hear what you think those two things have in common or why you feel like you had a, a certain um, capability in both of those forms. I find a lot, that's a good question, uh, uh, observ observation. I found a lot of uh, comedians I know tell really good stories especially when it comes to scary campfire stories, because it's all, they're both of them leading up to a punchline. In one case, it's a ha-ha that you elicit, and the other one's a scream, right? It's like you're, you're burying these hints in your story for the reveal, which usually turns it, flips it on its head. Um, so comedy horror, I, I think it's a natural transition for me. Something like drama is harder for me uh, as, a, as a comedic or horror storyteller, because that's what I do naturally. Um, since I was a kid, apparently, I like telling ghost stories. Um, but you know, as a as a five year old, I didn't sit around telling the my my, my kindergarten friends the, the the long drawn out story of my parents uh, finding a job and coming to Canada. Like uh, no one wants to hear that when you know that's not a natural thing for me. Uh, so I've had to that that to me was very difficult finding the, uh, finding dramatic uh, storytelling um, uh, style that I would be comfortable doing. So I, I'm finding even now. Um, when I tell a dramatic story, I sort of have to put genre elements in it uh, to help myself along. Um, um, I don't know if that's a crutch or just or, or just something I like to do. So that just, I mean, I guess um, I guess that makes me wonder, like when you when you have an idea for uh, a story or even I guess even a good joke, since since they do have that same kind of like tension and release moment, um, are you like? when you sit down to write, are you saying, okay, I'm gonna build suspense, I'm gonna build suspense, and then something is gonna happen? Or do you know, like, this is the turn, this is what is lurking in the shadows, I already know, um, how do I build that track? Um, I don't ask, I don't consciously ask how. Um, I, I'm at this stage, like, I'm 52 now. Uh, I'm at the point now where I can just, it just rolls, like, I, I feel, you feel the story. 
right? Like I feel when it's too long or it's too short or if a scene's not, doesn't have enough stuff in it. Like I, re I rarely have to do that now. Um, for TV, of course, I have to now because I'm, I'm now thinking, what do the producers want? What do they, because they, you know, you always get a bunch of notes uh, <laughs> with all, with your outlines and so forth. Uh, you have to think about the beats of the story. Um, but apart from that, in terms of like just writing and uh, writing, for example, a first draft, uh, I, I don't consciously uh, look at the mechanics of it, put it that way. Cool, thank you. If possible, I would love to, uh, to uh, hand the mic to Varsha, who also has some questions uh, maybe about writing and about inspiration. Yeah, I first wanted to start off with just asking because I mean, I know that you've talked about maybe like not having specifically any Asian role models in the entertainment industry to really look up to when you were starting to find your voice. So just right off the bat, like if you could give advice to yourself at that time where you were, you know, figuring out um, your voice and your writing style, what would what would you tell your younger self? Um. Well, the younger self grew up in the 70s and the 70s was a very different world than we are in right now. Um, maybe I'd say, you know, maybe don't fight every fight in front of you. But apart from that, there, there, the world was such that I think I did everything what I, I took the path that I had to take uh, to get where I am with the voice that I have. Uh, I don't know how else to say that. I, I'm not someone who, uh, because of where, the, where I grew up, um, I look back and even every failure, like uh, every failure I look at was crucial to me having this voice right now. So when people say, oh, you know, you, I made my first sale in TV at age 49, they're like, wow, that was really late. And I'm like, actually, it was exactly when it was supposed to happen. Um, because I remember, um, I remember the first time I was invited to Hollywood for a, what I thought was going to be my big break in 2004, when I was a comedian, you know, you're invited to NBC, you know, that you... Everyone wants to meet you, you think? And you know, I was ready. I had a TV ideas, I had everything. And then they're like, okay, nice to meet you. I get back to Vancouver and absolutely nothing happened. Like it just fizzled out, like just nothing happened. And it was too early for me. I looked back at all those ideas I had and I'm like, oh, that's not good. That's not good. That was, this is, this is trite. I like, think nothing worked for me. And I, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm envious of those people who can make it when they're in their early thirties or late twenties, I'm like, wow, you're way wiser already than I ever was at that age, but um, I'm ready now. So I, I don't have it. I don't have anything I would tell the younger version of me, except maybe a pat on the back, you're going the right way. Uh, even though you're going to make a lot of sucky decisions and you're going to hurt people, people are going to hurt you, but it's all for where you're going to be. I love that. It's like, um, it's like, there's no rush almost like one thing that at least I've personally struggled with this feeling like there's there's like a big deadline, but it really isn't. It's up to, you know, me. And I, I really like the way you put that. Um, I do have another question. It's a little unrelated, um, but about the stories themselves that you did create. Was there a specific thing in your life that really triggered some of those stories? Because they're so out there and um, they're amazing to listen to. I was wondering, what if there was something in specific that inspired it? Um, that's a good question and a good observation. Uh, I, I keep a notebook. Uh, now it's on my notes app. Uh, it, it's all transferred of every single idea I have uh, for stories. And I've been, it's, it's decades old. Um, so that's how the big loop came about. Like even something like, uh, if you listen to something like, um, uh, um, uh, I don't know, the eye of the Lord um, that came from having coffee one day and imagining, oh, imagine if I couldn't see the sky because something just landed. And then I, I, I mixed that with an image of a rocket that I saw in the news, or one of Elon Musk's vehicles going up into space. Uh, that's how I got the needle. I'm like, oh, imagine it was God's eye going in. And then I add in my, my personal, and then you have those ideas, but then I always put in a personal thing that's not in, the, in my notes idea uh, or my notes booklet, which is something like I used to be an ex, I used to be a youth pastor and I used to be an evangelical youth pastor before I was a teacher, I was very full of, I was full of faith. I was one of those guys. And then I became an atheist. Um, uh, and a lot of, a lot of those themes, I, I, I need to, like, I don't like talking about it. You can tell right now, I'm, I'm very awkward in talking about things like that, but you put it into a story, everything becomes a metaphor. And it's much easier to talk about it with nuance, where it's like, what do you mean by that? I'm like, I don't know what I mean by that. I know what I felt by that. So here's the story. You could feel what I felt 
without me having to explain in an essay form. I'm not an essayist, I'm, I'm awful at essays, uh, which is probably an awful thing to say as a former high school English teacher. Um, but, you know, some of my kids did okay. <laughs> Paul, I think it's fantastic the way that you describe sort of having to take your own path because you can't, uh, you know, a person can't be like 20 years old and, and, and look at a 50 year old and say, I want to, I need to, I want to be there. So I need to go in that direction because you have to go in a million other directions before you get there. And I, I know a lot of our students, um, uh, I mean, part of what we try to do is educate them in a really broad way. Uh, so that, uh, you know, people like Griffin Mason who worked on uh, the sound engineering can, can do sound for theater and now has experience doing sound for podcasting and it just, just sort of branches from there. Um, and then with, with his permission, Griffin, I think I might, I might hand the mic to you. I know you had uh, at least a couple of little questions. Yeah, uh, thanks for coming, Paul. Um, I, I both acted behind the mic. I, I don't know how you would say that. I was both behind the mic and in front of the mic. Um, so, but I was wondering, like, how long does it take you to, like, start to finish, like, do this whole project? Like, how much time editing? How much time writing? Um, like, do you budget your time? Because, like, you have these seasons and, like, deadlines you want to meet. I'm just, I'm curious the, like, release process behind these podcasts. Yeah, so to take some the good question is take something like The Surrogate, uh, which is, I think, 40 minutes long, uh, if memory serves me correctly, uh, around there. Uh, so from from writing, so I haven't started writing yet. So once I put pen to paper or, or keys to fingers to keys, to the time we finish recording, um, and mixing, and Steve has mixed it. We did that in three weeks, um, which was very fast. You know, like I hadn't even written yet. So that was off of, and I, that I, we worked off a first draft. I didn't because I, I only had my wife to bounce ideas off and for her to read. When she's busy, that's it. Like then then I'm, we're going off my first draft. Um, uh, which that's how we end up with Andrew Garfield as president. Um, so we got uh, writing, and I'm I'm calling uh, Joanna, uh, the the actors at the same time, Joanna Gaskell at the same time. Like, hey, can you do this? And then she's like, Yeah, I'm, I'm in. And then we, um, uh, I forget where we recorded that. I think oh, we recorded in my basement, so that made it even easier. Uh, so there's nothing to book, uh, and Steve's really quick. Um, uh, yeah, so that that. And by the way, Steve had no experience mixing audio before The Big Loop, like none. He went to Vancouver Film School, so he knew how to edit pictures. And I asked him, I'm like, you know, we, we've known each other since third grade. And I said, we've always wanted to work on something. Do you want to work on this with me? Um, the only difference being I'll pay you. And he's like, yeah, let's, let's do it. And so he was learning as I was learning. Um, so that was a lot of fun. So uh, if you ever get a chance to do a passion project and you can rope in a friend that you've known a long time, like for example, I have the Lord, there's that scene where that needle rocket goes up and the music builds and everything. I didn't describe that in my script to Steve. He just knew from knowing my walk of faith, uh, from knowing the way I became an atheist and knew, knowing how much anger I had towards God at the time, because he went through it with me. He's like, I bet you Paul wants to hear this. And it was incredible. He had pulled that out of me. Uh, I could not have described how I wanted that, but Steve just sort of in, in, uh, somehow knew that's what I wanted, that I needed to hear maybe. Um, so if you could do that as, as like outside of Ohio State, when you do your own audio projects, if you do, uh, find someone who knows you really well um, and who, whose friendship is strong enough to sort of like withstand any disagreements that you have. You know, I've seen, I've heard a lot of people talk about how important networking is, especially in the uh, entertainment industry. But I, I think another thing that, that I'm learning is that uh, the, the people that you network with aren't always the, the people who are already above you. They're your current peers. So all the people who are students, all the people you know now are already a network of, of people that you can collaborate with and, uh, and work with going forward. That, uh, if I may add to that point, Brad, like even when I'm looking at this uh, gallery right now, like one or two of you are probably gonna make it pretty, you know, like, like make the connections and then you're gonna bring uh, the other one or two in this gallery with you. That happens in Hollywood all the time, I hear it constantly, like uh, people uh, rise with their peers. Um, uh, this writer I know, Tony Toast, talked about how he went to school with the guy who ended up do making True Detective. And he called Tony and said, hey, you wanna come and meet my, you know, it, it's, it's all who you rise with. Um, instead of like what you said, Brad, like uh, someone looking for someone above you to help you out. 
All right, but still, three weeks, that's bonkers. The, like, all, all of these podcasts, I don't, want, I don't want you filling these kids' heads with unreasonable expectations. Uh, is three weeks like an average? Uh, for a 45-minute thing with this one actor, um, you, you, you can do it uh, if, if the, if, with the permission of your audio editor and engineer. Um, if you have everyone's permission, you, you should be able to, you can, you can do it in three weeks. I don't advise that you do in three weeks. I, I advise that when you make your own series, fully produce at least two episodes of the season before even announcing any, like just, just get it ready. Um, Cause you know, it's, it's the game. You're always gonna end up behind. In the final week uh, episodes of the season, you're rushing and you, you'll, end up do, you'll end up doing a whole episode in three weeks. There may be a few people on this panel who, for whom that is very a familiar feeling. <laughs> Uh, that's fantastic. All right. So uh, ostensibly, we're here to talk about the sort of intersections between podcasting and theater. And uh, it's, it's great to hear that you already have some experience in theater. And uh, I would love to hear any other thoughts you have about their sort of uh, sort of relationship. I'll, and I'll just start. Like one thing that uh, I know as a, a scene designer th is that uh, we do a lot of pre-production work. Everything has to be ready by the time the performers set foot on the stage. Uh, but then we just like go relax for a while. <laughs> uh, the lighting designers, they, they're a little later in the process, but again, they, they work really hard for a week or two because uh, there's work they can't get done until everybody's in the room. But then there is no, no uh, post-production work for us. Uh, and so that's, that's the biggest difference that I see uh, so far with podcasting. I'm sure the same is true for uh, film and television is that there's a lot of work on the back end uh, before it goes live. I was wondering if you had any other thoughts about that or uh, other sort of overlaps between these two media. Having never uh, done theater, I've written plays, but they went nowhere. So I, I, they never entered a theater, uh, thank God, uh, in hindsight. But um, the, all the stress, I imagine all the stress we feel on the back end, on the production end, uh, in audio drama, is what all of your crew feel live. Because you have to perfect it at the time. Like it, it, now this light has to go on or you know the the set designer the costumes the, the the lights all of that is what our sound designer does afterwards on their schedule but you guys have to do it live so because you're conveying a mood and the, the 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 main job is to convey that mood and tone to, uh you're, you're providing that state that, that's part of the stage um uh from the way i look at it so i can't imagine the stress every night of having to go out and recreate that stress again uh, in audio design, it's, 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 it's compartmentalized. This goes first, we edit it down, put it in sequence and then start adding these sounds um, and then pass it on back to the producer to, for edits and, and so forth. Uh, where uh, going live, I, I can't imagine that kind of stress. Uh, I've heard about it, uh, I've seen it parodied in movies, but I, I can't imagine, I, want it, I can't imagine voluntarily walking into that kind of stressful environment. You know, you're right, like theater, liveness is like one of the most crucial parts of theater. And that's one of the things that we've really been struggling with this year. It's like, can you really, is it still the same thing if people are just watching it later? Have you ever worked in live audio? I guess it would be like radio or anything like that. Our, our, our TV show was called The City News List and it was live to tape. So they could bleep out swear words, like, because it, it would go on the air, uh, I, think, I think about uh, just a couple hours uh, later. Um, I did stand up comedy. And I always felt bad for the guys who did props uh, with, that, with sound cues, because every different club has a different person. And so they have to give them a list of here, I need this here, this here, this here, this song here. And I'd, 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 I'd laugh uh, knowing who's working the sound booth that night, because I could predict how well their set's gonna go um, or how poorly. Uh, it was entertaining for me, but I don't know if it was as entertaining for them. So it, 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 I think at theater, you, got, you have so many moving parts. Uh, I've never been in, I've never touched anything like that. I know one thing about uh, theater is that you just got to hope that it works that night. And, you know, if it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, you, just, you know, life moves on. But uh, when you're pre-recording something, you have the opportunity. Well, if it if I don't think it's super perfect, maybe I can still go back and, and tweak a few things here and there, which can be, you know, maybe a blessing or a curse. I don't know if that's a, a, your experience or not. Uh, that, whether it's a blessing or curse for you guys. <laughs> yeah, it's. it's I, I like the luxury of, as an independent podcast, like I, 
whenever I feel stressed, I'm like, well, I put it, I did it to myself. I'm the one who made the schedule. I'm the one who told everybody it's going to be released this time. I'm the one who got the advertisers and promised them this delivery date. So it's all on me. So you just do it over and over until you learn not the thing better, but yourself better. Like I, I, it was really me learning what I'm capable of, how long it takes me to do certain things and how I react under pressure and how I treat the people around me when I'm feeling that pressure. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, I would love to open up the questions to anybody uh, out there watching, but also especially to our uh, students and uh, faculty and staff. Are there questions or thoughts you have about maybe even things that you learned uh, as a theater person uh, sort of stretching into a new media? Um, yeah, I had a quick question um, about writing and um, getting a story from beginning, middle and end. Um, I know like for me, it's like whenever I write something, it's like, I'm so excited to get to this end part that you end up like going back, you read it again and you're like, wait, I skipped a lot of things. Or like you ask someone else to read it and be like, I, this doesn't make sense to me. So I guess like my question is, is how do you like with the audio drama, it was so specific with so much detail. How do you um, not like rush that ending? Uh, that's a good question. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, liking the sound of my own voice. <laughs> so as a former pastor, a former high school teacher, a former stand-up comedian, I like having people interrupt while I'm talking. And I don't want to get to the end. Like I want to, uh, I want to defer the ending as long as possible. And so I'll fill it with, with, with what my students might call bullshit. I call details. And uh, just, I just, uh, just, um, I notice with a lot of things I do in my life, I enjoy the process. Uh, sometimes the, the end product is too, maybe I should be thinking about the end product more often, uh, um, but I, I do enjoy the process. So I learned to sit in it. Um, I learned to like, you know, sort of like, um, I sort of act it out in my head. I'm like, oh, it's, this is what it feels like. And I'm, I'm, it's, it drives me a little batty because I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling, I'm talking to myself out loud, these stories. Um, and right now I'm thinking about the way I wrote the surrogate. I was like sort of moving around the city, uh, 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 carving a path in my rug, walking back and forth. And, but just enjoying the telling of it, but I'm also enjoying pretending how people are gonna hear it. So if you remember that we're writing for an audience, maybe that would help um, just, just imagine them, how they would hear this. And maybe that would help you sit in the joy, finding the joy of telling it. Um, Cause that's why we all do this. Uh, uh, if you only focus on the joy of how they will respond at the end. I think that might, that might I can see that being frustrating. Um, also, I'm a fly fisherman, so I have to be involved in just the process. If I focus on the product, uh, I'll just quit. I never catch anything. That's fantastic. The way you describe it, uh, writing, it's almost like writing becomes a performative act. I think that's fantastic. Mm. Uh, does anybody else have other questions? I had a quick question. Um, so as we went through this process, we obviously had Mandy there to help us, help direct us in our performance. And I was very curious uh, what your process was, uh, you know, with the big loop in general, having your actors come in and record, and sometimes they might have recorded in a studio versus your basement, but were, were you there and almost in a director role or did you, you know, what, what was that process like? That's a really good question. Um, let me say this. Uh, I, I would always tell people, um, maybe a better story. So the day I, I got a call from Marvel to direct Marvels, um, I tried to talk them out of it. Uh, I was on the phone. I was like, you want me to direct it? I'm like, I, I, I don't direct. I'm not a good director. And they're like, who directed The Big Loop? I'm like, well, me sort of, but some of the actors did it on their own. Like I, the Lord Haley Henninger, uh, her and her father, they just recorded it. I, didn't, I wasn't even there. Uh, for, uh, for you, um, uh, 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 Lauren Shippen directed it. I wasn't even there. I just wanted the final product. My work came in the casting uh, and I trust my casting instinct. And if, and if I don't make a good casting call, it's my fault. I'm not gonna fix it with directing or make the actor feel funny or, or fire them. I'm not in, of that mind. Um, I'll probably have to get over that by the time I get the TV. But I, that, is my, that is my process. I, I, it all comes in the casting. So when it, when it came to Marvel's, um, we only, we only did a few takes for safety. I, I, would, I would pray that they would get it on the first take, right? And I don't do line readings or anything. I just try to sit, I, I squat out of the way 
I let them do the line. I sort of like, not I, point, I feel like a conductor, but which in this, when I say that, I don't mean I'm, I'm moving anything. I'm just trying to get them to play their instruments really well. I'm just trying to physically urge them. Yeah, keep doing what you're doing, ignore me. I'm just physically wishing it all comes together the way I have it in my head. Uh, for Big Loop, I, I would often like uh, bring in Snow when he did Goodbye Mr. Adams. We're in the, uh, a hotel room in Seattle for PodCon. And he did it mostly in one take. The scene, like we'd have to take breaks because some of the scenes were emotional. And I just sit there and like, you okay? And he's like, I'm like, you ready for the next one? He goes, yeah. So I hold the mic and sort of like get out of his eye. I, like I just need to get out of the way. Uh, that's my, that's how I see directing an audio fiction. Just put all the work into getting the actor to that moment. Like there in front of a mic, mentally ready. You cast it right, you wrote it right. Now I just need to step aside and make sure I capture that performance. That is it. Um, maybe not the best directing uh, method, but that's the way I do it. It's worked for me. Now as an actor, that's both terrifying and like awesome. So I, I totally feel that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, it comes in handy because you know I've never worked with uh, celebrity actors before. When I was at Marvel's and Method Man walked in and I was a huge fan. And he walked in and I, I'm the one who cast him. I, I had to, I told everyone, you, trust me, we get Method Man. He he knows comics, he knows this character. They're like, okay. And then as soon as he started talking, I looked back at everybody, at the executives. They're like, yeah, you made the right call, of course, right? I'm like, yeah, it's like, it's like of course. It's like, this guy just killed it, right? And it's, it's uh, yeah. And it, and if, if, if any of the actors had not done well, they all did, but had they not done well, uh, I, I know for a fact, I would not have forced him to keep going and going and or redo these lines. I, I would just say my fault, never hire me again. You know, it's, 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 it, that's on me. It's not worth this. We're telling stories. And I, I, I think I wish more people realize it's not worth making anyone feel shitty when they're doing their best in this format. We're just telling stories which, and the purpose of which is to bring joy, right? It's, it's, I, I know we lose sense of that when there's a lot of money involved, but uh, that's that, that's what I think it all comes down to. Well, there's very little money involved on our end. So we're, we're still <laughs> completely in, in the joy area. Now I've got like 20 questions about Method Man that I can't ask you now, now that I realize that you've worked with him. But uh, one thing I am noticing is that um, in, in theater, you know, we've got a lot of really clearly delineated roles like off the stage. Like there's a director, an assistant director, maybe a dramaturg, and then there's, assistance for this and helpers for that and it seems uh i think what i'm learning is that in podcasting it's, it can be pretty fluid um it can be fluid but it, but it's, it's fluid in the way that i think those roles are like if, if someone needs help then you step in but it's actually quite like it, it's everyone has a role and everyone has toes and you don't want to step on those toes as you're doing your roles and everyone loves feeling great about the role that they that they perform right so um uh, for example, uh, 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 Misha Stanton and I, when we we're doing Marvels and recording, um, we had to record all 12 episodes in 10 days. Um, and we, we managed that by constantly checking in with each other. Like, uh, uh, do you mind if I do this? Do you mind if I do, like when we step into each other's uh, spaces. Uh, and we're, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful working with someone like that who, who, who worked the same way. Like we, we respect each other's space uh, if I'm about to step in. Because sometimes Misha would hear something that I don't hear. So Misha would check into my ear. Do you mind if I step in, and physically come in and talk to the actors? I'm like, oh yeah, go, go on in. But I could see a, a situation where a lot of audio engineers would have just walked in to save time and, and possibly risk uh, upsetting me because I'm, I'm in my zone um, as a conductor. All right, so we've already talked about a, a number of differences between um, uh, live performance and performance for recording. I, I wonder if uh, you have any other insight or if any of our um, student actors have any thoughts about the difference for, uh, between uh, embodied acting and, mm -hmm. and voice acting. I didn't direct that question to anybody. So let, <laughs> here, I can, I, can Brad. Brad. I can step in, Brad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, something I noticed being in all the recording sessions uh, for these plays, I noticed like there's still a bit of physicality behind the actors too. They're like still living and breathing the characters behind the mic. So it, I, I don't think it necessarily ends from my, from what I saw. So. I don't know if anybody felt that they were kind of holding back or doing a bit much while they were in there. 
Yeah, let me ask the other actors, what was it like to perform in front of a mic and not an audience? Um, it was almost a little bit more like freeing because you're like, you know, it's Griffin and Kia. <laughs> it's like, I can really do anything. And they're like, I can, you know, make some weird gigantic movement. And, um, you know, it wasn't so much of a worry about looking dumb. So I think that's something that I really liked. And like, maybe it was something that I was like, oh, I should probably be a little bit braver <laughs> when um, I go back to the stage. That's fantastic. Varsha, do you have your hand up too? Yeah, like there's something that's like weirdly like intimate about like rehearsing on Zoom and just like you and your your computer and then being behind a microphone. You don't have to, you don't have to make eye contact with anybody like, um, the, when we were recording it, I had like these like big ugly tears the first time I did it. And I was like, well, hey, no one's gonna see my face, this doesn't matter. So it was just, yeah, like, like Jacinda said, it was really liberating. Dom, I think I saw your hand too. Yeah, I kind of feel the opposite, not that I, I didn't enjoy doing it, but I, I'm definitely someone that feeds off of a lot of people's energy when on the stage. And so it was really introspective and I was very in my own head, which I already am even in the theater setting. But um, it was just like, I was in theater, you get one shot when you're on the stage, you know? And so you know that if you deliver that, that maybe you can make up for it later in another scene. But here you have the blessing and the curse as we talked about of, I deliver a line and Griffin and Kier are there and maybe I didn't deliver it the way, you know, I have these ears listening to me, but maybe they say it's okay, but I don't think it is. And it was just, that was a process I kind of had to get through. Cause I've done like singing on a mic in a studio by myself before, but doing acting, but not having an audience was, was definitely weird. Was it strange? Uh, uh, let me ask Dominic, was it strange in that situation to uh, not have someone there to react against? Uh, Definitely. It, it, it was a lot of filling in to the imagination. Mandy and I had had a lot of talks. That, this is specifically for Wide Awake playing the priest because very much the story is him talking to the you know audience, but not having that, it, we, we definitely came up with this idea of, well, he, we're imagining he's sitting back in a chair telling this story. And I really had to get comfortable and think on the other side of this mic are a lot of people who are leaning in to listen to this. I don't need to be loud and, and you know echo this across an auditorium. This is a very intimate conversation and definitely had to fill a lot of that in um, in my head for that. I'm just gonna remind uh, everybody out there that if you have any questions, you can put it in the q and A. I'm gonna ask one more if I can, Paul. Uh, I think uh, we came to you, I, I, I wrote you an email. You'd never met me in your whole life. And I just said, I, I'm used to doing theater. And when you want to do theater, you're like, well, let's, there's a play here somewhere. Let's, let's pick up a play and do it. And so I thought, oh, we'll, we'll do audio drama. I'm, let me just find a script somewhere and I'll ask the author if they wouldn't mind. But that's bananas, right? No one does that with podcasting. They generally uh, create it, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, unless you're the BBC. Uh, and they have access to a lot of things and they do beautiful work. Uh, I, I, I hate that in this podcasting era, uh, we tend to overlook the BBC quite a bit. Uh, we, we, you know, I, even my work, sometimes I'll hear my work, uh, like the black tapes, like, oh, you know, I'll hear, it, hear about it and talked about in a certain context. I'm like, let's not forget the BBC. They've been doing this a lot longer and consistently in that genre. <laughs> They've been doing horror. They haven't stopped. It hasn't, uh, it's just, it's, it's maybe not in podcasting form, um, because they have a, a different player and stuff uh, recently, but their stuff, uh, um, I find it's, it's I, I wish more people would go back to it. Um, and I, I'll make a shout out for one of the productions. If you could find Solaris, their version of Solaris from BBC Radio, it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard in my life. Uh, and I keep going back to that. Whenever I start a new audio project, uh, I go back and listen to that and the way they made that uh, as a way of like, okay, that's the goal, that's the bar I need to hit. I would just uh, uh, highlight that comment because BBC, you know, their theater is is a different thing in, in Europe and in England anyway. It's it's held in high regard, 
um, and they do fantastic work. But their audio drama is exquisite and it has the largest audience of any of their dramatic work because it's just listened to all over the world. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's really fantastic stuff. Uh, oh, I'm out of questions. Do you guys have any other questions? My I gosh. did have a question if I Yeah, Devin, go ahead. Um, Paul, you've talked a lot about being on the casting side of, you know, these audio works. And I think a lot of us have really enjoyed exploring the genre. So I was just wondering if you had any tips on like, what you look for or like how it might differ from obviously we're used to standing up on a stage and singing a little song or <laughs> doing a monologue. Um, so I was just curious what you would say to that. Um, I, I listen to a lot of audio drama and, and podcasts in general because uh, I got the three dogs. And so my goal, my version is just, you know, one earphone in. Uh, so the other ear is listening for bears and coyotes and cougars. And I, I walk the dogs for an hour. Um, and if something makes me stop, and rewind and go, what? And, and then it just impacts me in such a way. For example, the Bright Sessions, uh, the reason I became friends with them is like, they hit my radar when I was listening to the first episode and, and, and it was so authentic. It made me sort of like uh, put my hands on, I, I remember the trail I was on, it made me put my hands on my knees and sort of take a breath. Like, wow, that was really good. That was really, I need to contact these people, let them know I thought it was really good. Um, and that happens quite often. Um, where I'll listen to something independent or um, I'll listen to uh, audio drama, radio drama revival, a podcast I listen to regularly to get, you know, tips on what's the new, the new voices coming up. Um, I listened to something recently in the last year called Harlem Queen. And that made me also, you know, keel over and go catch a breath. Like, wow, that was beautiful the way they did that. And, you know, there is no thing I listen for. Just, I guess it's emotional resonance. Um, Sometimes it's audio resonance. Uh, it's it's uh, something that make you know the, the the way the sound match the mood. Uh, it's it's. I wish I could have a more specific answer, but be, because it's so subjective, um, I I don't have one thing that hits me. It's a, they're all different. Uh, but that's what I look for. So the thing that makes me stop, rewind, and listen very closely, um, which I probably shouldn't do when I'm hiking in in a forested area with my dogs. So Thank in you. In theater, we have to work hard to uh, get the audience into the room. Uh, but once they're there, you know, they, it would be rude to leave. Uh, but my sense is that with podcasting, you you have to really actively engage with the listener who's driving or walking their dogs or doing other things, maybe. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's, it's tough because, you know, we have complaints from listeners sometimes and they're, they're trying their best to give us advice. Uh, you know, hey, can this be louder? Or can this is this is too loud? Can it go softer? And and I notice it all depends on the environment they're listening to. Um, so you know, uh, for black tapes, we sometimes think, okay, they're going to be driving. Let's make sure they can hear this while they're driving from their speakers. Uh, so when you listen on at home, some parts are really loud. Uh, but we needed that because the person, uh, thank God, we did that because uh, it turns out a, a Hollywood executive who ended up being our manager, it was his assistant listening to the black tapes in 2015 driving back and forth and getting stuck on the highways. He was listening to the black tapes, fell in love with it, put us on his manager's radar who ended up flying up to sign us. Um, if not for that, if it was too quiet, he would have just hit next. Um, me, so he never would have discovered the big loop then because that's too quiet. I purposely make it not as loud because uh, I, I don't think it's meant for car, for driving. I think it's meant for being at home, uh, focusing. So it, 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 all, it, it all depends. You just try to imagine your listener um, which is an almost impossible task, uh, but uh, that's that's the way I do it. That's fascinating. You kind of have to rely on on the listener to sort of curate the environment themselves. Yeah, I, I try to imagine what kind of person would be so excited by this podcast, they would tell another person, like they would tell their friends. What, what person would do that? Um, the Black Tapes, we said, you know, let's make it such that when people are at a Halloween party this Halloween, they'll tell each other, dude, listen to this. And that's exactly what happened. And then, because we heard about it on The Nerdist and he was at a Halloween party in Hollywood and he talked about it on The Nerdist. And he goes, everyone's talking about this Black Tapes thing. And so it worked out almost exactly the way we had planned, um, luckily. For the big loop, I thought, I think it's gonna be more, it's gonna be harder. It's gonna be more people who quietly share with their friends. Uh, maybe they'll text it to them or maybe they'll tweet it or put it on a Tumblr. Uh, I don't, but I think I see a quieter person uh, talking about the big loop. And it turned, and from what I've seen, that was accurate. Not accurate, but that's the kind of audience I tend to get for that one. Um, not as mainstream, but you know, uh, very valuable. 
Well, can I ask you a little bit more about audio? Uh, you worked with uh, Steve Jen on uh, the audio for The Big Loop, if I'm not, not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you originally, when you write a production, well, no, wait, let me start with theater. When a playwright writes a, a show, they might say, uh, this character says goodbye, and then they exit stage left through the kitchen door. Or they might not put that in there at all. What, what kind of information do you give to your audio designers and engineers about how the audio uh, marries with the words? So uh, wh whoever I work with in terms of the, on the audio side, the engineering side, um, I'll give detailed paragraphs. So in the dialogue, I'm like, here, music starts at this point. And I'll give them a link to the song or they'll have the song, they have all the sounds they need. And I'll say, link here, start at the 39 second mark, build over three seconds so that at the three second mark, we're at full volume here uh, and then fade out at the 17, you know, at the uh, 17 seconds later, uh, but let's do a 10 second fade out uh, so that the last note of the song hits at the car sound. So it's very specific. Um, that was how, that's, that was for my process with Steve uh, because I had a very specific vision of the way I wanted this to go. And then there's room where I'll be like, like I have the Lord, I'm like, I don't know what to do here, help me out. And he'll just go with it. And you know, 90% of the time, it's exactly what I want. Uh, with Misha, who's done it so often, Misha Stanton, I would just put like song cues and then crash. Cra Misha knows what I mean by that. Like Misha has uh, a, a, a toolbox I can't even, the size of which I can't even imagine. So they would just plug in stuff and I would listen to them like, yeah, uh, maybe a louder or softer, you know, just it's very easy instruction. So um, yeah, it depends who I'm working with. But uh, the point being, we, we pre-communicate how we're gonna do this. Uh, like, you know, like I'll, I'll say, I, I'm, I'm gonna give you detailed notes. You still want the job? And they'll be like, yeah, let's, let's do it. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's broken down into sound cues in, this, in the script. And would you say that like working with uh, good sound engineers has affected the way that you write now for audio? Um, yeah, I think I take it for granted. I've been spoiled. Uh, I've been spoiled by Steve and Misha uh, and Terry at the Black Tapes. I, I, I've, I've, I've never worked with anybody that I had to like go, oh, why did I hire that person? I've been spoiled. So uh, I just write it taking for granted. Uh, I guess that's a good thing I get in, my, in, in the way I approach things. I take it for granted that I'm gonna write this, they'll know what to do with it. Um, and, and just looking at the landscape of audio engineers out there, the ones who I'm, I'm friends with, you could do that with uh, so many of them now. There, there's so many great audio engineers out there for hire. Um, uh, it's, not, it's not a worry. Uh, I'll, I'll fit my, I'll fit my uh, note style to them. All right, so uh, in two minutes, our uh, carriage is going to turn into a pumpkin. So before that sort of magically happens, I, I want to give every, everybody an opportunity to thank Paul again uh, for joining us. I know you've got plenty of other things to do, uh, but it's been a fantastic opportunity for us to meet you finally, obviously. And we really appreciate you going out on a limb and letting these students take the work that you, you work so hard on and just like screw around with it and see if they can make it work. So thank you again for that. And uh, I want to give you uh, the last word if you have any other thoughts. Um, thank, I, 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 thanks for having me on, first of all. And thanks for reaching out in the first place. Uh, because I think the first time you wrote me, I said thanks, but no thanks in a very polite way. And then you told me, oh yeah, thank you. you it was such a polite, I don't have time to respond to everybody, but you, yours was such a polite uh, presentation. Uh, and then something about your reply to that, uh, let me know that you were a teacher. And that's when I was like, oh, this is an educational situation, hold on. And so that's when I went back to it and I reread your first one. I'm like, oh, you're talking about using it as, as a teaching tool uh, for students, which is I, I'm always into. Uh, so uh, thanks for being patient with me in the way I responded. Uh, and and uh, I think I was a bit curt in my first response. So thanks for looking past that, Brad. Uh, and thanks to everyone for, um, uh, for valuing my work uh, such that you were willing to take the time to reinterpret it and uh, 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 stepping out of your comfort zone. Uh, and uh, uh, let me just say, for those of you who actually loved the process of making audio drama, it is a burgeoning industry. Uh, I know you'll be looking for jobs when you leave. I'm not saying there's jobs out there, but it is, it is another way to get a different story out there. So if, you have a, if you're a screenwriter or a playwright, you know, and you're having trouble finding financing for something, try to think about it as an audio drama. 
right? To put out there as I, I hate using the word IP when it comes to this, but as IP that might get attention, right? Just put it out there. Um, it's, it, it was, everyone's writing these days, um, but not everyone's making stuff. Uh, and if you're fortunate enough to be, to be able to make stuff, uh, use, use that opportunity. It's a perfect way to end it. Paul, thank you so much. Thanks students for all your hard work. I know your work's not done. Uh, thanks to everyone who watched and uh, uh, I hope that you guys take the opportunity to uh, take a look at our work and at uh, Paul's work, uh, the, uh, the Big Loop. Take care.